welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. You know, we've been talking about the beautiful squares in the quilts for a long time now. Today is the day that you're going to have the fun of finding out how to put that quilt that you've been making together. The tatting which can be done with a needle is very, very popular now. Claudia Newton will be along a little bit later to share with you how to do this very tatting right here using a needle. And even if you thought you never could tat, Claudia thinks, seems to think everyone can tat doing the needle tatting way. Isn't it pretty how tatting can be used in combination with Madeira applique and in this case, some beautiful machine embroidery? We're gonna also have a whole lot of fun doing some really fun crafts and, and children's projects. If you've ever wondered exactly what would make a teacher happy, I think this little clipboard is so absolutely adorable. It has to the greatest teacher ever, I love you, Tommy. That would be a great gift to take to a teacher anytime. For those of us that love sewing, I bet almost all of us love buttons. This is the cutest little bulletin board with all kinds of buttons just glued on. Absolutely great for your sewing room, kitchen, or wherever you would like to have it. And this is one of the most adorable little I love art aprons for your child. It also converts into a little tote bag. So if your love is quilting or crafts or uh, needlework tatting, just hang in here with us because we have a very spectacular show for you today. Won't you come on over to the technique boards with me? Louise does the most beautiful job of putting quilts together. Let me review it first and then we'll go over and let Louise share the finishing touches. First of all, this quilt has sashing that comes all up and down the sides and all across. Here's all you do to make this beautiful batiste sashing. Several strips of batiste, several different sizes, kind of get them all cut and ready to go. Then butt them up together. And you see this little piece of lace? Well, the lace is going to go over everywhere those pieces of sashing have been joined. Next, pretend like these are the squares that have been embellished so beautifully. Once again, cut your pieces, butt them up to your embellished squares, and a piece of lace goes over each one of those places where the squares have been joined. Now this is really very easy. I'm going to zigzag the piece of lace down. I'm going to show it to you from the back. It's already been done. Then I'm going to, it's already sliced in the middle because remember they're two pieces of fabric. Then I'm going to fold one part of the fabric back, fold the other part of the fabric back, and zigzag along the edge. Now remember, I've already straight stitched it, so now I'm going to zigzag it, and then all I do is come in here and trim, and that's called extra stable lace finishing. Now to put the whole quilt together, I'm going to once again get more strips of lace, the length of the whole quilt, I'm going to sew that one onto the sashing and then bring this one over and I'll have a strip on this side over here too. You see it's beginning to go together just like a puzzle. Now here is one whole section that's been put together. You will notice there's some water soluble stabilizer behind here and I'm going to take this piece over and ask my friend Louise Baird to tell you all about why we have the water soluble stabilizer behind there. In order to give you a more complete demonstration of the quilt, I have invited my very close friend and business colleague, Louise Baird, to join me. Louise, welcome to the show. Thanks, Martha. Um, in doing this with the water-soluble stabilizer, I'm always teasing everybody that I cannot sew a straight line. Okay. And, <laughs> and, but it's not really a tease, it's the truth. <laughs> I can't sew a straight line. So whenever I join something like this together, if I put a strip of salvi that will overlap the two areas and then pin it so that they're touching, pin it to the stabilizer, and then I can put the uh, lace on top of it and it'll help me to sew straight. I also will sometimes use a temporary spray adhesive so that it all sticks together and I might not use, need to use as many pins as oh, I ordinarily Louise, I love would. That stuff. <laughs> okay, so let me take this out of the way right now. Now, to cut the binding, um, what I do, I have just a little piece of fabric here, and it's marked with the width of the fabric and the selvage and the selvage. And if you need to cut lots of binding, it's easy, an easy way to do it is to fold it on the true bias where you are having the width of the fabric down, so you have a fold, and that's considered the true bias of the fabric. 
and then you just continue to fold it, always keeping those fold lines together. And you end up with a piece of fabric that looks like this. Now all of this edge is the bias edge. So what I usually do is trim off that little fold and then just start cutting the strips of bias or the strips of fabric that are now bias so that I have all of these long pieces of bias. Now, and then you ju would just sew them together so that you have one long strip. Now to do the binding, it's um, this time I'm going to do it a little bit different than I usually do and I have my little quilt sandwich and I'm just taking a um, strip of fabric of the bias binding, I folded it together putting the raw edges, uh, even with the raw edges of the quilt, or my quilt sandwich here, and then I'll take it and fold it up, and I've also just done this on two sides of it. I didn't do it all the way around, just did it on the opposite sides, and then on this little piece here, I've got it where I, on the pieces that I've already stitched, I'll fold over and pin, and I fold it over that edge right there, so that's a finished edge. Now I'll take my next piece of binding, fold it at a 45 degree angle, and if you match that seam allowance, which I've got marked right on the edge of this one, uh, where that seam allowance is, in stitch, you can get a really pretty mitered corner. I really have a hard time sometimes uh, matching up the corners, so right now I'm just going to stitch this little area. If I can find my right spot there. And stitch just a tad, but you would certainly go all the way through. And now you take this, it's folded at an angle, fold it up, this goes down, this way, back on itself, and then, whoops, it came undone, and then you fold it down, and you end up with a much pretty, nice, neat, mitered corner. That is a fascinating trick, and it looks a little bit easier than the traditional mitered corners. Right. Is that what I think I hear you yes, saying? Yes, yes, it sure is. <laughs> oh, Louise, thank you so much for being here. I thank always you. love it when you're on the show. Thank you. And next, Claudia Newton will share with you how to do needle tatting the easy way. I am so happy to have as my guest today my very dear friend and business colleague Claudia Newton. Claudia is editorial director of the Fancy Works section of So Beautiful magazine. She has recently completed a year's course of study at the Japanese School of Embroidery. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. What we're going to do today is needle tatting. It's really a very simple technique. There's only one stitch that will be used, and you use it to form different parts of the tatting structure. What we're going to talk about today is ring and thread tatting. The thing that you'll be looking at today are the small rings around the border of this bib. To get started with it, we're going to actually cut the thread off of our ball and thread it into our tatting needle. This one is very large and we'll look later at a smaller needle just to see the different sizes that you can do. I've cut a very long piece, again, because my cord is very large, but if you're working with a smaller needle, you'd certainly use a smaller thread and cut it shorter. To begin, once it's threaded, you want the needle in your right hand. With the end of the thread in your left hand, you'll bring it behind the needle and hold it in place with your right finger. To make the first half of the stitch, which is called a double stitch, the first half hold the thread between your three fingers of your left hand. Scoop your index finger underneath the thread. Once it's wrapped around, the needle comes below, hooks under the loop, and comes off the end of your finger to create the loop onto the needle. For the second half, we bring the finger forward and under. Once you've looped it, bend it towards you. We're still going to go toward the tip of the finger, but this time you're going down. So once you've slipped the loop on, it comes onto the needle, and that's your first double stitch. We're going to continue to make a couple of these and just let you see how they look. 
this direction, then I wrap it this way, come down, I make another one this way, and down, wrap it towards me, and away, and now we're going to make a pico. That's the decorative little loop on the end of some of the rings. What you want to do to make a pico is exactly what we did before, except when we pull it onto the needle, we're going to stop some distance away from the previous stitch. Then I'm going to continue with my stitches just like before. I'm going to put a series on here now so that you can see how we would make a real ring. I need four double stitches on each section separated by a pico. Now when I pull that down, you see the pico form. I'm ready to make another pico. I've stopped some distance away. I'm going to put four more stitches on here. There's my third one. Here's number four. I need one more pico for my design that I'm going to do. Under and towards me. That's two, there's three, and here's my fourth one. Now when I'm finished with the fourth one, I have this chain of stitches on there. To make it into a ring, I want to move my left hand so that it comes inside the circle of my thread. I hold the stitches on the needle with my thumb, and I'm going to pull the needle all the way through. When I do that, you'll see this loop. My thread is really long here. <laughs> see the loop that starts to form, and it will pull it down into a ring. The way I make another ring now is just like we did that first stitch, and it's similar to a pico because I stopped some distance away. Then I complete my stitches. Now I would continue to do this. My pattern again is four double stitches with a pico. The difference this time is instead of making a pico here, I'm going to join this little section to my first ring. And that is done by putting the thread behind the first pico here. I slip the end of the needle through, and this is a little tricky. I'm going to wrap that thread and pull it back under. And you may prefer to do that with a crochet hook. If it's a little hard with the needle, a crochet hook certainly works. Then I would continue, let me slide it down, continue with my pattern just like before to make my rings. Now, a question that everybody always has is, when I run out of thread, what do I do? Mm -hmm. So let me show you. <laughs> this one is ready to pull through and make my next ring. You cannot add thread except at the end of a ring. So what you'll have to do is to go inside again, pull it through, let the loop come off. Once I've got the loop made, I stop. I take another threaded needle, and this time I'm using colored thread so you can see the difference. I come up in the last double stitch that I made, I bring it through, I'll tie the ends together, and this is going to be, my hands are in your way, I know, but let me tie the knot so that you can see the two colors, and then you'll see how it's done. There are my two colors. Once I have the knot in place, take the needle, thread it through a couple of your stitches. When it's pushed down almost to the eye, then you can thread that tail through here. I got the wrong end. <laughs> wrong end again. You'll thread this tail through the eye of the needle, and then it will pull on through the double stitches to anchor. Now, I said I'd show you what it looks like very fine. This has been very large, but you can use thread this small and the same design that we just did that was so huge comes out to be this size with a smaller thread. So that's the difference in your thread size and your needle size. Claudia, that appears to go pretty fast, it too. It does. It really does. I think that's really why so many people are excited about needle tatting. It is beautiful and a mm -hmm. little bit faster than another yes, kind of tatting I, I have seen done. <laughs> yes, it Claudia, is. Claudia, thank you so much. Thank you. And next, I have an artistic apron tote for you. I think all of you mothers, grandmothers, and teachers are really going to like this adorable little project. This is an I Love Art apron. 
You see it has a little string to go around the neck. It has three little pockets here with three little hands. All of this just done with paint. And let me show you something really cute. When you finish your, using your apron to keep clean at the art uh, easel, then you can hold it up and you have a little tote bag. And I stick all those little uh, ties in there. Now, isn't that a cute little apron? First of all, to get the, uh, well, let me show you how it's made. You have this little piece for the bottom where we do the sewing in between and make the little pockets. Then this little piece is for the big pocket area. And then, of course, we have the top. And this is just a purchase bias. It's been folded over and stitched. Now then, let me pull the little uh, motifs up here. I love art, and the little hands are simply taking some uh, fabric paint, emptying it into a little uh, styrofoam paper plate, and here's the one for the little hand. Simply dump it in there and come over here and transfer it and let it dry. And then here are the little letters. All of these are available at craft stores and you can put whatever you want, including, of course, the child's name would be fun too. After you get this done and it's all dried, then it is time to put on your purchased bias. Now this is the kind you just simply get at the store. You don't need to make it. You just slip it over. And we also have to get those handles in there. So let's just see how the handles are going to work. Slip the handles in on the front part this way, and then after the handles are pinned, go ahead, pin your bias strip right on top of those handles. Now let's see what happens on the back. The handles have got to be pinned in on the back too. So pin them and just stitch them down. Then after you finish all of your handle pinning and stitching, we're simply going to take the bias tape, the purchase bias, no point in making it, just buy it. The bias tape, you know it really curves real easily. I really like working with bias tape, whether I'm working on heirlooms or just a little fun project like this. And we're going to encase the whole thing. I'm going to stitch them down one at a time. We're going to encase the whole thing with the bias tape. And then I'm going to stitch this down and sew on a little bit of bias for the ties to go around the apron. I'll also have to stitch a little bit more of the bias around the neckline to actually make that into an apron. Now, isn't that a fun, cute project for you? And I'll, and I'll tell you what, I think your little ones would really enjoy helping too. Next, I have a craft for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, our daughter, Joanna Pullen Hammett. Joanna is a recent graduate of Texas Christian University, and Joanna, welcome back to the show. Why, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Today, I've got two fun crafts for you. The first one is a clipboard, and this is what it looks like with the finished product. Isn't it cute? You know what? I would love to make I that for love. a teacher. Oh, Don't of course. So? <laughs> of course. It's so fun. Let me just show you how to do it. First, you just buy a clipboard at your local office supply store, discount store. Next, you need to slip a piece of newspaper underneath so when you glue your pretty buttons on, it does not get all over your clipboard. The next step is to get your favorite buttons. I know I have lots of buttons that I've collected over the years <laughs> in my sewing chest. And you simply put the buttons on however you want. And here's an A for a school teacher. And also, I'd like to tell you, some buttons, as you see, have the loophole behind them and to get rid of that all you do is just clip it with scissors and therefore it'll stick easier. But anyway, you just put the buttons on however you would like. A little bit of glue. With a little <laughs> bit of glue, that's right. And finally, I you do not have to, but I got a bow, I tied a bow and I stuck it on the top to accent it. So then like I said, again, your finished piece looks like this. You know what? You could even write anything on the computer and right. print out. That's just right. a purchase this is piece what, of paper, Right. This is it? just a purchase piece of paper, uh -huh. and um, this would be a perfect school teacher's present. Oh, I and think it would, too. this was done on the computer, but, you know, you can get your children to do one with crayons or whatever. You so that's what? a great, That great would be project. more special, uh -huh. wouldn't it? <laughs> it is. The second project is a fun, fun bulletin board that looks like this. Lots First, of buttons Lots on and that. lots of fun buttons. <laughs> First, you just take a bulletin board that you can buy at your local discount store or office supply store. Next, you take your paint and you paint all the way around the edge of your bulletin board. 
Finally, like I said, again, you have all these fun different buttons that you can stick in and decorate all the way around your bulletin board. And they, there again, if you have the loopholes like this one, and your bulletin board has creases, you can just simply stick it in the bulletin board. And your finished product looks like this. And you know, this would be great for a child's room or even a college dormitory. Well, and a sewing room. It, or a sewing room, that's I right. I can just think of the different times when I like to stick something that's up, right. little reminders. That's right. Well, Joanna, thank you so much for You're being welcome. here today. It's good to have you back on the show. You see, we just have all kinds of fun in Martha's sewing room. And Joanna, what it reminds me of, all these buttons, you don't remember her very well, but your great-grandmother, my nanny, used to keep all the buttons off of all of her clothes, and we had a button, a button box. So it would also be very sentimental if you did this, not with new buttons the way we did, but with buttons that somebody in your family had collected. And now won't you come along with me to my attic? I'm pleased to introduce to all of my Martha Sewing Room viewers our newest granddaughter, Cecil Elizabeth Hammett. Cecil is nearly three weeks old. The joy of heirloom sewing is to have something 100 years old to put on a brand new baby. This little dress is of the 1880 vintage. It has the scoop neck and the pretty lace and the very, very long skirts. The christening dresses oh, around 1880 had very, very long skirts, which, by the way, are very much in style now. And our new little doll is named Cecil Elizabeth, and I just wanted all of you to meet our new grandbaby. Now, the little dress that I have over here for you in the attic features absolutely beautiful laces and Swiss embroideries and the tiny, tiny little buttons. You know, we've talked so much about tucks being the, one of the number one features on heirloom sewing. It always has been, and I, I suppose we love tucks as much today as we did a very long time ago. This dress features tucks on the bodice. It features tucks on the sleeves, a beautiful Irish crochet lace, as well as Swiss embroideries, and the bottom has a very simple bottom, just the little hem that is turned under with the Swiss embroideries, and um, the little motifs in the middle are, they kind of stand up like a little cathedral. Oh my goodness, I think Cecil's little footies are coming up here. See how little she is? She's about the size of a good roast beef. Hey, darling, can you smile for everybody? Anyway, the joy, the joy of heirloom sewing, the joy of babies and grandbabies. It is so much fun to put something beautiful on a baby. And we also have enjoyed putting the antique clothes on Cecil Elizabeth as we have on some of our other grandchildren. And another thing that I really like to do is do a portrait of the baby. And then as our other little granddaughters got older, and could wear the size twos and threes. We've also had some portraits done of them in antique clothes. What I've especially liked doing then is then presenting the antique dress to that particular grandchild to be put away with the picture. Thank you so much for joining me on my sewing room today, and won't you come back next time? <laughs>